Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for joining us for Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm David Schwartz, uh, Chair of Medicine. This presentation is going to be recorded uh, for future reference. You'll be muted when you enter the meeting, and at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A icon. Uh, use this icon uh, to um, uh, uh, submit your questions rather than the chat uh, feature. The Q&A icon is easier for us to compile the questions uh, that you'd like to have answered. And I'll moderate the question answer period at the end of the presentation. Uh, the presentation should go for about 50 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time uh, for questioning. In a crisis, experts spend a great deal of time thinking through a series of hypotheticals. Uh, what are the weak links in the chain and, and what do we do about them? Uh, the likelihood of, of these contingencies, uh, the responses and the consequences of these contingencies are a, a, um, a focus of uh, these uh, uh, discussions and, um, and uh, of trying to think through how to deal with a complex problem like uh, the coronavirus crisis. Uh, so what about PPE? Uh, why might we run out of PPE and what are the consequences? Our, our medicine chief residents have thought about uh, this potential uh, uh, contingency and have prepared an in-depth discussion about not only what happens, but what happens next and what are the implications. Our three speakers are uh, Samuel Porter, uh, who um, is uh, a chief resident and he plans to become an academic hospitalist and will be working in the Department of Medicine uh, at the University of Colorado focusing on home hospital care. Deepa Ramaduri um, is uh, planning to do a fellowship in pulmonary medicine at the University of Pennsylvania uh, starting in July. And Neelam Mistry uh, will be uh, joining our academic uh, uh, hospitalists uh, at, in the Department of Medicine at the University of Colorado. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Porter will be the initial presenter. All right, thank you, Dr. Schwartz, for that introduction. Um, thanks to the whole Department of Medicine for allowing us as the chief medical residents uh, to present at this grand round. So we're really happy to have this forum and to have this honor and opportunity. Um, none of us have any disclosures uh, as we're all at the beginning of our careers. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna get into my part of the talk, which is about healthcare supply chains and the stressors and vulnerabilities that are inherent in those supply chains and why those, ran, why those led to us uh, almost running out of PPE during this crisis. So um, as I was doing my research for this talk, I got to interview some interesting people and I got this great quote from Sarah Cathy, who's uh, in the UC Health Supply Chain Department. And this quote really gets to why it's very hard to care about supply chains, but that they're really important to care about because as long as they're working, nobody notices that anything's going wrong. You have the drugs you need, you have the equipment you need, but as soon as something um, goes wrong in the chain, suddenly you're not seeing things on the shelf and you can't take care of patients the way that you want to. So as it turns out, drug shortages are actually a major problem and they happen for really complex reasons, but they all have to do with the supply chain. Um, and the same goes for medical equipment. Um, the impact on patients of these supply chain deficiencies has never really been uh, fully uh, quantified, but we all have anecdotal stories of times when we wanted to prescribe something or especially now, times when we felt vulnerable taking care of patients during the pandemic, um, when we didn't have access to the uh, equipment that, um, that we might have felt we needed. So I've always had an interest in supply chains. Um, this dates back to a job I had in a former life. I worked uh, in a small African country for the Clinton Foundation, helping them uh, optimize their supply chains of antiretroviral drugs. Um, and ever since then, I've just kind of had an interest in this topic. And so um, I decided to do uh, research for this talk specifically on um, the uh, vulnerabilities in the healthcare supply chain in the US um, and how those affected our PPE supply. So just to, just to further convince you that this is an issue, um, if you look at this graph, which is the number of new drug shortages by year, um, you can see that in the latter 
the second decade of the 21st century, they became more frequent than in the first decade, and they're projected to become even more frequent now in 2020, especially in the context of the pandemic, where we've seen a number of drug shortages. And when these drug shortages happen, and part of the same study, you know, honestly, most of the time we don't know why they happen. Um, but when the reasons, when we do know the reasons for them, they almost always have to do with some kind of deficiency in the supply chain. So you can see here, it's, it adds up to about 72% of the time they know something went wrong. It has to do with a manufacturer, supply demand mismatch, or raw materials issues. I'll go through all of those in this talk, but I just want to hit home that these are issues that we've known about for a long time and vulnerabilities that are just kind of always there. And just to finally drive that drive home that point, this is a quote from Time Magazine about what would happen if there was a, um, a pandemic uh, flu and there was a need for N95 masks um, and that we would put in orders for millions of masks, but uh, our, the global exporters that we work with wouldn't be able to meet the demand. This is a quote from 2009. So from like 10 years ago, this has been on people's radar that, uh, that these kind of issues would happen. I just thought this was interesting because this exact, almost this exact thing happened uh, just a couple months ago. Um, and we've known about it for a long time, but it's one of those issues that we tend to kind of uh, not really pay as much attention to um, until there's an actual crisis. So hopefully what I can do in this talk is teach you a little bit about how supply chains work, well, where the vulnerabilities are in the healthcare supply chain, why they led to these PPE shortages, and some of the solutions that we're doing now, and hopefully help you get to think about things we can do in the future. So what is a supply chain? This is my very basic uh, schematic of how a supply chain works, and I've used uh, the simple example of making peanut butter. Uh, where you start with a raw material, that's a peanut, then it gets manufactured into peanut butter in a factory. Then after the factory makes a bunch of peanut butter, they send it to a bunch of warehouses. Those are the distributors. Um, they make deals with the final consumer, who's this store, who's uh, going to sell everybody um, ultimately their peanut butter. Um, so in healthcare, things are a lot more complicated. Uh, we have um, a varied, uh, varied uh, chains for our raw materials. Um, that come from all over the world and involve some really weird things. Um, then when you get to the manufacturing phase, you're making things like active pharmaceutical ingredients, medical grade glass, things that are uh, very highly specialized in terms of manufacturing. And then our distribution networks can be extremely complicated and involve a lot of third parties um, and, uh, and these complex networks where there's often not a lot of communication. And then finally, the last the last part of the chain, the consumer, the ones who are really driving the demand, that's complex as well because you have lots of different players who are in, uh, inputting into the demand. You've got the hospital systems themselves and the executives that run them. You've got the doctors, nurses, and pharmacists, all who have different stakes in the demand for all these products. And then finally have the patients who are going to be the ultimate drivers of, of what we need at any given time. And then overarching really every single part of this process is the whole uh, body of regulation. Um, so in the U.S. we have the FDA. Um, there's different ones all over the world, but that kind of is also a major part of the complexity of the healthcare supply chain. Um, so this diagram is almost too simple, but I think it's sort of beautiful in how simple it is. It's from a presentation that was given about vulnerabilities in the healthcare supply chain um, by the people from the Strategic National Stockpile in 2017. And it just lays out this really, really simple uh, framework, which I want everybody to keep in mind throughout this talk, which is uh, when supply of our goods is high and demand is low, we're in this green zone and we don't have to worry about anything. We've got plenty of, plenty of stuff to go around. It's when supply gets low and demand gets high that we get into this red zone and we start to see shortages. And so I'm going to take you through these components of complexity in the um, supply chain and then focus specifically on PPE, which drove down our supply while our demand was extremely high and got us into this red zone um, where uh, we started to run into trouble. So the way I've laid it out for the talk is into uh, four different categories that I kind of identified in my research that are what kind of how I thought the, the four main buckets for gaps and stresses in the healthcare supply chain. Um, so number one is bottlenecks. Number two is the structure of the supply chain itself. Third is the inherent complexity of the healthcare supply chain. And then fourth, I'll talk a little bit about how regulation uh, plays into all of this. So first I'm gonna start with this idea of bottlenecks. 
And I want to use surgical gloves as an example because I think they're a great example of uh, how these bottlenecks can work. So I'm talking here about OR quality, procedure quality, surgical gloves. They use latex, they're sterile, they're a highly specialized product. Um, so uh, at first glance, uh, if you look at the entire world, if you look at three of the bigger companies that make surgical gloves, it doesn't look like a bottleneck at all. Uh, they have factories all over the country, um, in North America, Europe. Um, then you see this concentration here in sort of Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands. Um, you may wonder why there's such a concentration there. Well, the reason is the main ingredient in surgical gloves, which is rubber, um, is uh, almost exclusively produced in these countries that I've highlighted here, which are in Southeast Asia and the islands. Um, this is despite rubber being native to South America, um, because of economic forces and globalization, a lot of the raw material production has kind of ended up just in these countries. Um, and uh, to make a further bottleneck, if you're talking about uh, medical grade uh, latex rubber used for surgical gloves, 90% of it comes from the country of Malaysia alone. This is according to a report from the Malaysian Rubber Board in 2018. Um, so this, this, you can see how rapidly this bottleneck down to just one tiny area where a critical component of the, um, of the surgical gloves is made. And this is actually true for a lot of products in healthcare. So something that we use every day in internal medicine, uh, heparin uh, for DBT prophylaxis, um, as most of you probably know, um, it's derived, uh, one of the main ingredients is derived from pigs. And as it turns out, 80% um, of the pigs that are used to make heparin all come from China. And this led the um, bipartisan House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee to ask the FDA last summer to look into this as a possible vulnerability of the country's heparin supply because of outbreaks of, um, of African swine fever in the pig population in, uh, in China. And so, again, we've built these uh systems where a lot of the raw ingredients um or even some of the um further processed goods or the supply chain all bottleneck in one really vulnerable area that can threaten the supply of a lot of our drugs and and um, products and put us at risk of these shortages so when the big players talk about these risks they separate them into the four p's um which are uh, political unrest port closures powerful weather and pandemics these again for um, a long time have been known as the major stressors to the bottlenecks in these supply chains. Um, and maybe you all remember um, a few years ago after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, there was one Baxter factory um, there that made mini bags for uh, IV solutions and IV medications. It caused widespread shortages of all kinds of medications because um, most of the uh, U.S. supply of these mini bags came from just this one factory. So there's an example of, of powerful weather, one of those big P's um, causing shortages. And then we're seeing the effects of, of a pandemic um, causing our shortages in PPE. So, so the way the structure has come out in the supply chain with all these, with all these bottlenecks is one of, the, um, one of the main stressors on the supply chain. So next I want to talk about the structure of the supply chain itself. Um, mostly what I want to talk about is kind of how the supply chain is a mix of public and private entities. And I want to talk about which parts are covered kind of by public entities, by like the government, and which parts are covered by private ones, and then where the gaps can open up because we have structured the supply chain this way. Um, so one of the main public entities that's kind of gotten in the press recently is the Strategic National Stockpile. Um, so as you can see from this quote back from 2016, um, even the people who run the stockpile have known for a while that there's a greater likelihood of shortages than most people realize. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about first, what is the strategic national stockpile? Why do we have it? What are its strategic priorities? Um, and then talk about how just by the way they've designed this whole system, um, it's, it, it doesn't have exactly the uh, capacity to cover us for a pandemic that, that people may think that it does. So um, here's, a, here's an article, or here's a story from NPR from 2016, um, where a reporter went to the Strategic National Stockpile and just uh, learned about it. Um, 
as you can see, it's the way they titled it was a government warehouse prep for health catastrophes. So the strategic national stockpile um, was actually created in 1999. Um, there were these lingering threats of bioterrorism from the Soviet Union. And so mostly what they stopped there are things called medical countermeasures, which are made to uh, kind of um, bolster the country. Uh, originally, the idea was if there was a kind of bioterror attack, but they've expanded into a lot of um, a lot of different contingencies to try to cover. Um, so they obviously don't have anything specific to coronavirus there, um, but they do have about $7 billion worth of medical supplies at any given time um, on, on hand. So I dug in a little bit and I found this, um, this budget, this multi-year budget that was published in December 2019 um, from the Public Health Emergency Countermeasures Enterprise, which includes a lot of different things. It includes BARDA, it includes research arms, and it includes the budget for the Strategic National Stockpile. And I think if you want to know what people are thinking about, then you can follow the money. Um, and you can see here, um, pandemic influenza was something that they were um, allocating a lot of resources to, um, something that they were planning on allocating even more resources to in the form of antivirals in the coming years. Um, and, but you can see that they're kind of spread out um, across a lot of different possible contingencies, everything from anthrax to smallpox to uh, having broad spectrum antimicrobials. Um, and I think this just makes the point that, and if you start adding up the numbers, they have a huge, huge budget and they're trying to cover a lot of different contingencies and there's just no possible way that they can cover for every single thing. Um, they're not really designed to do that. So what they do is um, they um, try to rely on their private sector partners to help bolster the supply chain um, in the event of a crisis. Um, so if you look at the um, Department of Health and Human Services pandemic influenza plan, the most recent one from 2017, they specifically do address supply chain preparedness, but their plan is to engage with private sector partners to develop and share strategies and priorities for the medical countermeasure supply. So really what they're saying is that um, the uh, strategic national stockpile is not big enough and can never be big enough to replace the kind of private sector supply chains. Um, it, it is a sort of inventory solution that can temporarily get you through a crisis, but you really end up having to rely on the companies and distributors who do this as their everyday job to help you in a crisis. And uh, here's why that can be an issue. So if you have something like a stockpile, um, then uh, you're gonna have a system that looks kind of like this animation where I've got a um, factory on the left, a warehouse in the middle, and then the hospital that's buying stuff on the right. And when everything's going just fine and you have a big stockpile of stuff, um, then the hospital buys, the, buys something, the uh, manufacturer makes something and it replenishes the supply and there's always a bunch there so that if the factory is unable to make something for some reason there's still a whole stockpile um, piled up so that the hospital can take things until they're ready to go again. So unfortunately that's not how these supply chains work. So the manufacturers and the distributors they practice uh, just-in-time inventory. So um, as soon as something gets made from the factory, it gets put on the shelf and almost immediately bought um, by the healthcare uh, entity that's going to use the product, whether that's a drug or whether that's PPE. Um, and so this helps reduce costs on inventory, um, and it means that the hospitals save money down the line. It means the um, suppliers save money. So it makes for a much more efficient system, but it's not very resilient. Um, so if the factory suddenly can't produce anything, that warehouse runs out immediately and then everybody runs out of things really quickly. Um, so the reason I bring this up is that these are, these are kind of manufacturing and supply practices that are geared towards um, optimal efficiency and maximizing profits. Um, and if, we're, if we've set up our system and the structure so that we're relying on these private um, uh, uh, private entities that that's just a vulnerability that's always going to be in the system because uh, they're not really they they actually are not required by any regulation to have any kind of um, pandemic preparedness plan um, or any kind of contingency plan uh, to make more stuff in the event of a of a uh, of a disaster. All right. 
So next I wanna talk about um, something that I'm calling supply chain complexity. Um, I'm kind of grouping a lot of things under this, under this one uh, category. Um, but what I really mean here is that um, there's at any given time, a lot of forces at play that are constantly pushing and pulling each other, making it really hard to predict for, um, for the purchasers and the suppliers, what's gonna happen next in the supply chain and what's gonna run out. This one's kind of hard to describe because there's a lot of different examples. So I'm just gonna give you a few examples to try to illustrate this point. So in the past decade, uh, there was a major shortage of sodium bicarb. This was maybe like five years ago or so. Um, there was a national back order of sodium bicarbonate. And so um, the supply chain started ramping up uh, the supply of sodium bicarb to, um, uh, to try to make more, but we were still kind of in that red zone where there was high demand. And so some um, ingenious compounding pharmacists realized this is sodium bicarb, we can compound this ourselves, why don't we just start making it? So they started making their own sodium bicarb and they started putting it into 60 milliliter syringes um, and distributing it to everybody that they supplied. This caused a shortage in 60 milliliter syringes that came out of nowhere that nobody was predicting um, that was directly a result of the sodium bicarb shortage, but, was, but no one had kind of thought through all those possible contingencies. And so that led to uh, skyrocketing of the cost of these 60 mil syringes, which we use all the time. And even in the raw materials that are used to make these syringes, those evaporated. And it caused another shortage somewhere else in the supply chain um, that was really, really hard to predict. Um, and this just exacerbated all the other usual stressors on the supply chain. Um, so another issue related to complexity is that we have these really broad networks um, of suppliers, buyers, distributors, raw material manufacturers. They're all connected, but they don't really know how they're connected. There's really limited information and communication between buyers and sellers. So you usually are in communication with maybe the warehouse you bought something from, but you don't know like the few steps down the line where they got their raw materials or where they put their stuff together. And so that can lead to a lot of confusion and again, a lot of unpredictability in what's gonna um, go, what, what is uh, you're gonna run out of at any given time. And then lastly, I wanna talk about um, for complexity group purchasing organizations, which is one of the more complex things, but I think really interesting um, to think about. And this was treated in a uh, JAMA article in 2018. So a group purchasing organization is something that uh, is used by many hospital systems to reduce costs. Um, basically, you can get together as a group of hospitals and say, we're going to put together all of our purchasing power and have an economy of scale so we can get deals um, on stuff. We can, we can pay, you know, if you're buying in bulk, you get a better price. And the group purchasing organization is this intermediary between the manufacturers and the hospitals. And it has a catalog that it, um, it gathers a bunch of products from the manufacturers, presents them to this group of hospitals, gives everybody a discount. It's kind of a win-win for everybody. What they get into in this JAMA article and some of the problems that can cause unpredictability and bottlenecks is that um, the GPOs often charge a kind of membership fee um, from the hospitals um, so that they can uh, um, uh, get like a little bit of reimbursement from the hospitals, but they also charge a vendor fee from the manufacturers. Um, and that can lead to problems because they have actually premium vendor fees. So you can, as a manufacturer, say, I want to pay an extra premium so that only my products are shown in the catalog that are seen by the hospitals. And the reason that's a problem is if for some reason that one manufacturer who makes, say, surgical masks or um, sterile syringes, their factory shuts down all of the hospitals who are in this huge group through the group purchasing organization now don't have access to any of that product. Um, and so through forces that are totally out of their control, things can disappear um, kind of willy-nilly. So if that's making your head spin, it's supposed to. That this, what I'm trying to get at is there's just tons of complexity in how this whole system is built up. Um, and it can be really hard to predict um, what, what happens. So lastly, I wanna to touch um, on regulation, which is another kind of stressor in the supply chain. In the US, we have the FDA. Um, if you wanna make a sort of medically qualified product or set up a new factory, you have to go through the 501k um, process, uh, which is um, a, can be a six to 12 month process. Um, which can make it really inelastic for the supply 
chain system to uh, react to changes in supply and demand. So you can't just simply convert a factory that made something else or build a new factory from the ground up. Um, it, there's a lot of regulation, especially in, um, in the medical world, which isn't a huge deal. I mean, that happens in a lot of um, manufacturing, but another thing to keep in mind is that as I showed you in previous slides, we have these global supply networks and every single part of the chain is regulated and every single country has its own version of the FDA and they all have different requirements and different forms and different processes. And so that's what really can drag um, the process of uh, ramping up production in the context of uh, shortages. Um, so that's kind of how regulation uh, fits into this whole, um, fits into this whole uh, milieu. So now that we've gone over those kind of four big categories, I'll shift to talking about the PPE supply chain in particular. So how did all these vulnerabilities play out in the PPE supply chain? And then I want to talk a little bit also about the kind of solutions that people are deploying right now to fix these issues. Um, so starting with this idea of bottlenecks. Um, so here's an N95. Here's the, here's the thing everybody wants. These are the five main components in uh, building an N95 mask. Um, non-woven polypropylene, polyurethane, polyester, thermoplastic elastomer, and aluminum. Um, so as I was getting to in my earlier slides, there is one particular ingredient here that's the main constraint on N95s, and it's this non-woven polypropylene. This is, uh, this is actually also the main thing you need to make an N95 work. It's this uh, kind of plastic um, uh, product that looks like pickup sticks when you look at it under a microscope. It's the thing that doesn't let anything through. Um, the problem is this non-woven polypropylene fabric is only made by a couple factories in the Northeast um, as far as the supply for most of the 3M and the N95s that make that are made. And those factories making the non-woven polypropylene, they're going at like 100%, but they're still not really able to keep up with the amount of demand that we're seeing for these things. Um, and I would just make a contrast with simple surgical masks like we're wearing outside and in the grocery store all the time. Um, they have much easier to procure uh, materials without these bottlenecks. And if you look at China as an example, they were able to increase um, their simple surgical masks from 10 million a day to over 110 million a day because they didn't have these constraints. We are not able to do that for N95s because of these specialized um, materials that we need. And in fact, if you look at the raw material need to make the non-woven polypropylene, which is polypropylene resin, that's the main um, raw material. That's actually mostly made, again, in one geographic region, or mostly one geographic region, China and Asia, excluding China, which was itself racked early by the pandemic. And so their ability to export this raw ingredient to make the N95s was also decreased. So that's another reason why we got pushed into that red zone with a low supply and a high demand, because we just simply aren't able to make enough N95s because of these bottlenecks. So then getting into supply chain structure. So as you'll remember, I talked about how the supply chain structure is globally extensive, but in the US also very reliant on the private sector to kind of maintain supplies. Um, so in terms of the uh, PPE supply chain, how this played out, at least um, from what I could see, is uh, you saw these bidding wars uh, start to explode over PPE. So I got one quote from one of our local supply chain people that the price of an N95 mask went from 60 cents a mask up to $1.85 to $2.50 per mask, which is huge. And they had some offers as high as $8 a mask. Um, and so Honestly, uh, 3M, who is the main uh, US producer of N95s, they got a lot of press and they got some bad press that a lot of their N95s were ending up in export markets. But they're just doing what they are designed to do, which is, um, which is produce masks and then put them out into the supply chain where they eventually get just sold to the highest bidder. They actually never, they claim to have never increased the price of their masks. They kept it at a low, kind of just above 60 cents a mask for the basic N95, but it was those intermediate, intermediaries and distributors who were jacking up the prices. And so that's led to the government kind of getting involved. So talking about solutions to some of this structure stuff, this is where something like the Defense Production Act comes in, which gives the federal government power to compel the private sector manufacturers to preferentially make anything that the federal government wants. Um, it also lets them enforce the prevention of hoarding of materials that are deemed scarce or necessary during the time of need, whether it's a war or a pandemic. 
and it allows the government to promote the production of stuff that it thinks we need. So it can they can give guaranteed loans. They can um, they can help uh, procurement and installing necessary equipment to the factories so that they can make these things. Um, one thing to note about the DPA is it's kind of unclear what happens if people don't comply with this law. You can be fined a little bit, but it's no one's ever tested it before. Um, so we'll have to see in the future if the companies comply. So far, they have. Um, and then lastly, how does this supply chain complexity, the complexities of the international supply chain affect our PPE supply? Well, um, so for example, China, again, produces over 50% of the world's PPE. Um, and as a matter of almost coincidence, the pandemic started there. So they ramped up their domestic production of PPE because they really needed it really badly. And they actually, um, totally uh, maxed out their ability to produce PPE in China and started importing it from other countries. This was early on before the pandemic had hit those other countries. Um, and, so, and then once the pandemic started to spread to those other countries, they were suddenly out of N95s because they had sold them all to China. This was covered in a New York Times uh, article uh, last month. Um, Another complex reason that we had a low supply of N95s is that the wildfires, if you guys remember this, this was the last disaster, the wildfires that were raging in Australia um, and uh, a volcanic eruption in the Philippines in late 2019, both together depleted our whole entire world supply of N95s, um, make, leading to for further exacerbating the shortage. Um, so when you think about these big forces and these, these global um, complexities that cause these shortages. Really, in my mind, the, the biggest solution that we're gonna have to do is cooperation on a, on a massive scale, a sort of unprecedented scale. And they laid out really nicely in a New England Journal article from recently about critical supply shortages. And they talk about how, um, especially in the United States, as we see regional outbreaks, uh, it would probably behoove us to have a system where um, states can communicate with each other about who needs what PPE, who needs ventilators, um, and they can distribute the supplies evenly um, and nimbly uh, from one state to another, depending on need. Um, and they, in the New England Journal article, suggest that the federal government might need to mediate this since it crosses straight, uh, state lines. And then finally, regulation. Um, this is just a brief slide of the letter that the CDC put out saying that uh, the FDA um, when they realized there was going to be a crisis in PPE, I'm sure you all heard this, they lifted some of their regulations on um, what were medical quality masks. So they kind of allowed, they said, it's okay to use the industrial quality ones, um, they're safe. Um, that's been the biggest move so far um, from a regulation standpoint. But again, the DPA kind of um, touches on this a little bit too, in that they can help support the production of, of new PPE if they need to. So um, this is my final slide on the PPE slide chain, uh, supply chain before I hand it over. So I just wanted to thank, first of all, everybody who's out there on the front lines, um, who's participating in this cooperation, even at a local level, because we've had a lot, we've seen a lot of policies at a lot of different hospitals that are intended to prolong our PPE supply for as long as possible. And so we've had people have to make sacrifices about what PPE they're using and how often they're, um, uh, reusing it um, to kind of extend that supply and that really helps drive down the demand part of this equation to keep us out of the red and in the yellow because once because once you're too far in the red you run out of all of it and there isn't anything for anybody so the more we can cooperate and um, and uh, stick with these policies to reduce the demand the better and then in terms of increasing the supply you know I think there's probably major restructuring and rethinking of how we do manufacturing and supply chains for healthcare in the United States that needs to happen. And that's kind of on a larger scale. Um, it's above my pay grade, but it's something to think about. And like I said, it's just a final word um, that this issue that's always in the background and never really a problem until, until you run out of something is actually something that should be on the forefront of our minds um, and that we should advocate for change uh, in the future. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Deepa and Neelam. Um, who are going to talk a little bit about what's going to run out next. Great. Thank you so much, Sam. 
So as we recognize the strain that the PPE supply was imposing on our hospitals, we also saw it filling the public sphere. We recognized another strained resource and began to worry what was primed to run out next was the resilience of our internal medicine trainees and really of our greater workforce. As chief residents, we are deeply committed to the voice of the 170 residents in our internal medicine residency program. We could see, hear, and feel the psychological burden of the pandemic. We hope to shed light on why training resilience may run dry, what tangible resources are in place to combat this, and the next steps forward. So why is this coming to light now? Trainees have been working in pandemics on the front lines since way before what this picture demonstrates, the first, what we think of as the mo first modern pandemic, an image of two medical students providing positive pressure ventilation to patients with polio in 1953 Denmark. There is little to recount the training experience and detail the moral conflict that many faced in prior times. So we looked towards more recent pandemics. We found a number of articles to describe the resident experience during HIV AIDS, often related to ethical obligations to treat these patients and fears of transmission um, to uh, trainees and the workforce. Then we saw the first qualitative analysis of resident attitudes with SARS-CoV-1. This described the challenges of a multi-hospital academic training environment for just 17 internal medicine residents in Toronto. Literature during both H5N1 and H1N1 influenza pandemics focused not surprisingly more on vaccination practices, but not on resident attitudes and resilience. There were a few regional articles during MERS highlighting concerns from the workforce at large. And then there is a single relevant article in the Bola outbreak that speaks to the benefits of bringing select trainees to the front lines and the educational opportunities that can safely be provided in that type of environment. So this brings us to today. Within five months since the first traceable positive case of COVID-19, there have been over 20 articles discussing trainee experience and strategies for physician resilience. Um, and as of yesterday, the Society of Critical Care Medicine put out yet another one. So the slide is already out of date. We presented this idea of chronicling the resident experience to our group. And we were lucky enough to have the support of about 40 internal medicine residents who provided us with their narrative experiences over the past two months. We'll highlight this experience through their voices and discuss next steps to maintain resilience as trainees. And I'll hand off to Neelam now to discuss how we thematically viewed this resident dialogue. Thanks, Deepa. So as we look at the current national sentiments from the perspective of trainees, we see a number of parallels between the vulnerabilities in the supply chain for PPE and the vulnerabilities for maintaining resilience and elasticity that's required of being a trainee. So trainees are known for their resilience, their ability to bounce back, uh, especially during hard times. But during the times of a pandemic like this, we're seeing some of, the limit, some of these limits pushed. So let's take a look at some of these parallels and the stressors um, between the healthcare system, uh, the healthcare supply chain, excuse me, and the trainee education. And we're going to be using some of the voices and perspectives of some of our residents that shared with us. So first, we're going to look to um, the vulnerabilities in the structure of trainee programs. So first, we're going to look at staffing. Recall that hospitals and suppliers keep a limited number of supply of resources on hand. But often when we refer to resources or supply, we think of a physical resource like PPE, but we often overlook something that's the most valuable resource and that is our providers. Residency programs, as everyone knows, have a limited number of spots based on funding and capacity for learners. And our inpatient services on the internal medicine side are staffed with the exact number of residents that are needed to cover a service and no more. If one person gets sick, we have a jeopardy system. But if four people get sick, that puts a big strain on the remaining residents left in the hospital. As said by one of our residents, everyone expects to be called in given the growing volumes at this time. The other structural aspect we saw as vulnerable was the concept of our traditional learner team. In an academic medical center, we have medical students, interns, residents, fellows, APP fellows, attendings, and many more. Each team has an equally important role um, to deliver the comprehensive and cohesive patient care that we all want to give. But team structure also exposes vulnerability in the hierarchy that naturally exists in medicine. While trainees appreciate the system's desire to minimize COVID-19 exposure, residents and medical students have questioned their roles as imperative members of the team. As you can see from the quotes listed here, when they're not included in the list of uh, member, team members who need to see the patient and what other tasks they're asked to complete instead.
Next, we'll take a look at the complexity involved in the trainee programs. As Sam mentioned, there are many layers um, and connections that go into making a functioning system. As trainees, we rotate through four different hospital systems. There are a number of benefits to this, including diversity of patient population, understanding of different resources, and an opportunity to uh, practice in a public, private, and national spheres. But what does it feel like when policies at one institution you work at are different from another? We all struggle with the speed of change, of systematic change between the hospitals we rotate through. For example, how consultative services are done during this time, PPE recommendations, and staffing differences on who does or does not assume care of COVID-19 patients. And this is something different in all the hospitals we rotate through. We're constantly adapting to change, the way we think about medical problems, not only in the disease states and the unique patients in front of us, but also the regulations and practices of the hospitals we are currently in, which will differ from the one that we rotate through in the next month. There's a significant emotional and mental fatigue in that exercise, further pressing on trainee resilience. As providers, we often th we think about our patients first, but to add another layer of complexity, we also have our own family to think about loved ones that we come home to, and the fear of bringing this novel disease there. This aspect is not unique to trainees. Um, it's something that all of us providers in this Zoom room have felt. The residents have a tough decision to make on a day-to-day -day basis at home, staying away from loved ones, which can be difficult when your home is a 600-foot apartment of shared space. So last, we're gonna look at regulation. There's a lot of regulations that residents are subject to. Um, just to name a few, the ACGME, our local GME, local hospital policies, and residency-specific updates. Despite balancing all the regulatory change during this time, the most affecting regulation is one that impacts, impacts the patient-physician relationship. And this is something that is, affects us all. And I'm sure every single person in this room has felt these next few emotions I'm about to share, and not just trainees. As we're well aware, necessary visitor restrictions have been implemented in hospitals across the nation, and residents feel that strain firsthand on how these limitations affect patients and their families. While non-resident providers go in the room, oftentimes residents are the ones making the daily calls to loved ones with updates. Typically, this is a powerful experience for us as trainees in making these personal connections. This is the reason that we all went into medicine in the first place. However, during this time, as you can see from the quotes displayed, patients and their loved ones are dealing with anxiety, fear, and grief, but what's different is that this is all done from a distance. The hardest thing about this is trying to convey the compassion, care, and worries through an impersonal electronic device. These experiences have left emptiness and dissatisfaction amongst our trainees that seriously challenges our resistance, resilience during this time. So looking into the future, how do we promote a positive residency culture of resilience and togetherness while still addressing these individual fears and needs during this pandemic? We need to recognize and be transparent about these vulnerabilities that we discussed. We're on a privileged path to becoming a physician, um, and being a physician lends itself to self-inquiry, self-doubt, and subsequently self-discovery. Very few prior studies comment on how to move forward successfully to maintain resilience in the trainee experience during a time like this. Now we're going to turn it back over to Deepa, who's going to discuss some of these prior studies and talk through tangible next steps. So little evidence guides us on addressing trainee resilience during a pandemic. That single study of trainee attitudes during SARS-CoV-1 was an exploratory study which suggested that open communication and strong leadership to navigate the rapid and dynamic changes in trainee life were key. During HIV, the focus was on education of trainees about their exposure to positive patients, how to thoughtfully approach the social history of these patients, and expectant management in treating young, critically ill patients who couldn't be cured of their disease. So we do definitely see a few parallels in both of these pandemics. We know that longstanding research uh, surrounding self-determination theory and workplace motivation also portrays resilience through three core concepts. And those are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. We were able to devise a way that connected these three concepts of resilience to our vulnerabilities in structure, complexity, and regulation. And we'll talk about that now. So autonomy promotes learners and physicians to have an experience that is custom built, to develop a style of practice and to learn by experience. This is now diminished with lack of control over time, being assigned to COVID services instead of preferred electives and unknowns in the hierarchy of medicine where only one provider can physically see the patient. 
what have we done to speak to this? We've increased our time for self-directed work as non-essential non resident electives were canceled. This includes connecting residents to COVID basic science research and systems level projects. Our residents have also led the way in virtual visits, managing sick patients at home. Tele telehealth has amplified the scope of care we could provide, and some of our clinics have even seen no-show seen no rates go down as a result. So where can we improve even further? We'll need to find unique ways to empower our trainees as direct care providers, whether this is allowing more flexibility in trainees leading discussions with families or just facilitating their daily leadership on rounds. If they can't be at the bedside physically, we must bring them there in some other sense that satisfies what they're training to do. Next, we move to competence, that deep medical fund, that deep fund of medical knowledge and clinical reasoning that we develop over time, which is particular, particularly valuable to our identity as internists. During COVID, that scope is severely limited to a single disease process with rapidly changing and often unreliable and unpredictable information disseminated through the media and our academic portals. What have we done to speak to this? Clear, transparent, and frequent communication has been at the forefront. We've streamlined informational and educational portals directed at our trainees where they can find vetted information in a centralized hub. We've also continued daily uh, delivery of daily educational content virtually. So how do we improve? We find the educational pearl in each patient case, whether they have COVID or not, and we expose it. If, the, if not the disease process, the social determinants at play, the ethical questions, the impact of caregiver burden, topics that we've discussed in Grand Rounds previously. Motivating self-directed learning counteracts the sense of missing out on all of the other medicine. We can empower our residents to be invested in and accountable for the virtual learning spaces that have been created. Relatedness is our psychological center. We have interpersonal relationships amongst peers and patients. COVID has removed physicians from the bedside and also removed the community of the workroom or the multidisciplinary rounding structure where physicians, students, pharmacists, nurses, therapists, dietitians, and so many other providers get to interact face to face. What have we done to speak to this? We deliberately foster a sense of community that both recognizes and respects providers opening channels of communication. Our program director, Dr. Connors, has led weekly town halls to answer questions, comments, concerns, and serve as the navigator and proponent for the unique challenges that face residents traveling across multiple hospital systems. Our More Than Medicine committee in our residency program is led by our associate program director, Dr. Adrian Mann, who has been a central pillar um, in helping us share stories and promote togetherness. Dr. Allison Brainerd, an assistant professor within the Department of Anesthesiology and her team started Project LIFT, which is a program that connects residents and fellows on the front lines to community volunteers who support one or more aspects of a busy trainee's life. Mental health resources have been abundant as well and recognized as a core principle of what we need to do moving forward in studies from around the country in the past two months. All of our training sites have provided levels of support. There's the RISE program at Denver Health and the Department of Psychiatry that encompasses support at both the University Hospital and at the VA. So where can we improve? There's a lot of programming happening in the community. It's our responsibility to provide the time, space, and a sense of camaraderie in actually participating. So at the core, we heard from many of our residents that they are proud and honored to be providing care on the front lines. There is optimism in what the coming months hold. COVID has not only brought, brought to light issues with our nation's PPE supply chain, but also issues in a physician's moral and ethical discomfort and obligations. This is a ripe time to look to one another and be innovative about thoughtfully expressing this in the public sphere and holding one another to a higher standard to do the work that we're so well trained and poised to do. We had a lot of help in putting together this presentation and first and foremost would love to thank our co-chiefs and co-residents whose voices you heard here today, as well as our internal medicine program and Department of Medicine leadership and faculty at the Health Sciences Library and within the Supply Chain Department. Um, it, all of their help was crucial in getting all of this information together. With that, we thank you so much for your time and we'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, this was an absolutely superb presentation uh, and it provided uh, me with a lot of information.
that helped me understand uh, the problems that we're having and and um, the concerns that uh, uh, are raised as a result of uh, excess demand on a system uh, that um, is is not used to that excess demand. Let me start with a question about um, about uh, the supply chain. Uh, I I I guess the key question here is. Uh, if you expand the supply chain uh, to make it somewhat unlimited, um, uh, it's going to be excessively costly. So how do you balance the access uh, versus the cost of the supply chain? Mm -hmm. We're getting a bit of an echo. Um, nope, I think we got it. Um, I think that's the key question. Um, the overarching question and the overarching balance for how to design the whole supply chain um, is that question of how much do you, how much, especially I think what you're mostly getting at too is the strategic national stockpile and how much do we want to invest um, in preparedness. Um, and I think it's just a really, really difficult question. I mean, um, that has to be answered by kind of almost on a political level. Um, so I, I do, I guess one way to answer it would be, and this is just my opinion, but it does seem like we need to invest a little more than we are now in, um, being ready for an event like this, um, especially because they're predicting that this may happen more often than it has historically due to other factors like global warming. So, um, we probably want to, um, invest more in that infrastructure than we currently are um, so that we're ready for uh, for these kind of uh, problems. Good. So let me ask the question in a little bit of a different way. Um, what Are there countries that do it better than the United States? Uh, and if so, why? Um, or are there particular supply chains that are more resilient than others? And if so, why? Uh, so that's a really good question. And the whole world has a globalized supply chain now. Um, and so a lot of the problems um, that uh, we're seeing are just seen all over the world because everyone has kind of developed these, uh, these, similar, um, these, these similar systems. I think if you look at the example of China, um, they, the, a lot of the manufacturing that happens for the whole world happens right there. Um, and so they were kind of inherently already prepared to ramp up their PPE um, and have it readily available. Um, so there's been some talk of, do we need to go back to maybe having more domestic manufacturing in the US, just like they kind of have in China, so that we're more ready for this um, and that we don't have to rely on so many different links in the supply chain to get um, supplies to uh, the people who need them. Mm -hmm. And what about, are there um, particular um, uh, um, areas of the supply chain, uh, like food or uh, pharmaceuticals or um, uh, um, ventilators, uh, that are more resilient than others um, in terms of um, supply chain um, uh, problems? I don't, I don't know the answer to that question specifically. Um, I think it, from my research and from what I know from my experience that you, uh, you see these similar uh, vulnerabilities in a lot of aspects, in all the different aspects of the supply chain. Um, and you're talking about supply chains even more broadly than just the, the healthcare one. Mm -hmm. And it's actually true. And it's true that the, uh, the food supply chain is being really strained right now as well for similar reasons. Um, uh, having to do with kind of bottlenecking and um, cutting off of the manufacturing of stuff because a lot of factories that make processed food are shutting down or having outbreaks of coronavirus and um, so there's um, a lot of a lot of worry about the food supply in the coming months um, and I would just say especially for vulnerable populations who already don't have a lot of access to food um, I've heard some interviews with with food banks about the food supply chain and um, they're completely running out of donations. Um, and so, you know, there's wide repercussions of that, but, but yeah, it's, it's 
you know, also vulnerable in this time of a pandemic. And how do we, um, how, how do we address the issue of distribution uh, differences? In other words, regional differences in access to the supply chain? That's a really tough one too, which usually the market forces just take care of on their own um, in normal times. But now we've seen a lot of kind of really competitive practices come out in these exacerbating times of the pandemic. So that goes back to my slide about how we really need cooperation on a bigger scale than we've ever seen before, which I think is A, everybody just has to commit to doing that. But B, I think there's gonna be there's going to be a need for a lot of data um, to be shared between places that have never shared this data before. Um, and so you could even imagine a world where there's collaboration between the federal government who's coordinating, coordinating everything, tech companies, especially something like Amazon, who are like experts in supply chain, um, gathering a lot of data and then making predictive models about where everything needs to go next as different outbreaks spread across the country, but we don't have any kind of infrastructure like that right now. It would have to be built and it would have to be built quickly um, by a specialized task force. So um, to be to be determined on whether we're actually going to do that. Mm -hmm. So would you suggest a, um, um, a central uh, federal repository that worked in the same way Amazon worked? Um, something like that, I think, could be a possible solution. Uh -huh. okay. the, uh, there was a question about um, the, the fires in the Philippines. Did you actually say that the fires in the Philippines used up all of the N95 masks in 2019? And if so, are the masks that we're using now, or have they been manufactured since 2019? Yeah. Well, I don't know about all of them. I might have been speaking a, a little loosely there, um, but it was a volcanic eruption in the Philippines, and then the fire, wildfires in the uh, in Australia that used up a lot of the um, N95 supply, and that's again the like the industrial N95s. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, we're, there, we're we also are capable of producing uh, N95s pretty pretty quickly. I don't know the exact turnaround time, but certainly some of the ones we're using now. Um, were were produced in the last couple of months. So you know the, this this uh, cost versus access keeps coming up. Uh, can we actually live in that green zone where we have high supply and low demand without bankrupting um, various sectors of the industry? Yeah, I I I don't think so. I think that's one of the points to drive home is that if you were prepared for every single thing and you had a stockpile of everything you would ever need for any contingency, it would be too costly. Um, and so it's hard to know what the solution for this is, is gonna be. Um, one possible solution is not to just stockpile a lot of things, but to uh, try to enforce uh, that private companies have more of a contingency plan for when there is a disaster because, and that would just be kind of recognizing that we have a, if we're going to have a, if we're going to have a structure, which I think, and I don't come down either way on this, I think this is just how our supply chain evolved and it's how we do it. Um, but it is uh, reliant on both public and private entities. And so if the private entities are going to have such a big stake in it, um, then we should we should probably think about requiring that they have a contingency plan for how they're going to change their manufacturing in a disaster and how they're going to contribute to uh, to helping uh, keep the supply um, closer to that green zone when it's needed. So what about the contractual obligations between hospitals and healthcare systems? And does this limit their ability to collaborate around GPOs? Mm, what do you, by hospitals and healthcare systems, you, you mean? Um, so yeah, I, how how do hospitals? How how do the contracts that we have with these um, with with these um, uh, group uh, purchasing organizations? limit the ability to collaborate and uh, to cooperate across uh, groups that have supplies or don't have supplies? Mm 
I no, see. They, um, you know, I even talking uh, with some of the people that I interviewed for this talk. Um, if you you if you have a contract with the GPO, that then you have access to a lot of things in their um, in their catalog, but um, you don't have to limit what you're purchasing to just the things from that catalog. But if you purchase it from that catalog, you get the good deal on it, you get the good price. Um, but I've talked with health systems who have expanded the people that they've purchased their PPE from to um, a really, really wide net um, to the point where you hear stories of people saying, we're making contracts with people we've never talked to before and they have to kind of like vet them and test their products on their own um, before they decide to buy them um, because they're getting them from just darker corners of the world um, and then but also kind of some innovators locally so uh, UC Health actually um, was able to buy some uh, 3D printed uh, face masks from like a local 3D printer in uh, Colorado who um, who just ramped up their production um, not someone that they would usually contract with not in their GPO um, but someone who just kind of wanted to help and so at least anecdotally I haven't seen a lot of kind of strain on people's ability to purchase things directly related to their contracts with the GPOs um, it's more just like when it's every man for himself or woman for themselves out there um, uh, with the bidding wars over the prices that it can get hard to find something that's that's you know fits within your normal budget okay and what about the um the the supply chain as it relates to vaccine and vaccine development you could imagine that uh, uh eventually we will have a vaccine um uh, the question is how quickly can we deploy that and what are people thinking about the supply chain related to the vaccine yeah i I don't know too many of the details on this, but I do know that that is a rate limiting factor in um, vaccine production and that they're consciously trying to research vaccines now that are um, that are more scalable, um, that use techniques. Uh, I believe it, that I can't remember the details of this, but there are certain techniques of making the vaccine uh, that are more scalable to, to factories and manufacturing than others. And they're trying to focus on those for that exact reason, because just because you have a vaccine that works doesn't mean you can get it to everybody. Let's, let's take you off the hot seat and let's move on to the trainee experience. Um, so do we know how other programs have addressed resident resilience during uh, the uh, coronavirus crisis? For example, Seattle or New York? Deepa or Neelan? Yes, I can speak a little bit to that. So the, uh, there was a lot of kind of preliminary information that came out within the first month of, we are going to see high levels of healthcare worker anxiety. I think it was Tate Shanafeld out of Stanford put out an article about how to kind of take action early and prevent some of that anxiety. And really the biggest part of that was promoting an open dialogue, asking their trainees and the people in their healthcare system what they were most worried about. And then specifically naming things like, is it PPE? Is it the effect on your families? Those are kind of the two big concepts that came up. And then Mount Sinai put out their kind of action plan in the midst of everything, I believe in February for their multi-pronged kind of approach to how um, they were addressing the significant emotional burden that coronavirus was having there. And the center of their plan was really focused around opening mental health resources to everyone and creating a, an open platform um, and kind of diminishing the stigma around that for healthcare workers. So really plugging in everybody with um, required kind of mental health check-ins was the um, core of their approach. Hmm. What's the connection between um, mental health and access to PPE? I can speak to that. Um, and so I don't know if there's anything that's been published about this, but we have felt a lot of that sentiment just from um, what we hear from our residents. I think one of the, the biggest things is that um, like Sam had talked about in terms of the supply chain, but also the complexity that's involved in working in different hospital systems. 
And so it's a, it's a big, um, it's a big source of strife for residents, especially when the hospital policies differ from one place to another. And so for example, um, one of the other stressors is getting fitted for a PAPR at one place versus an N95 versus a duck bill and not being able to get all of that fit testing done in one location. So having to travel from one location to another to get the right type of mask fitted. And so big source of strife um, for a lot of the residents. And I will just add that one of the earliest New England Journal perspective pieces that came out of University of Washington um, and then a, like a couple weeks later, a article that came up from the chief residents at Beth Israel in Boston said it had almost exactly the same quotes that we found from our trainees, um, especially in Seattle, surrounding concerns about PPE. Um, my parents are sending me PPE. Should I keep it? Should I donate it? Quotes like that were really coming out of those institutions that um, might have felt um, some of the strain a little bit more. So there was definitely a connection there between the anxiety and the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Okay. This gets back uh, to uh, supply chain, um, but it, it addresses a previous question, which is do other countries or other political systems uh, do it better? In the United States, our system is based on free enterprise and capitalism. Uh, so if it's economically optimal to buy things from China, we buy things from China. In contrast, uh, the Chinese manufacturing distribution and export system is uh, semi-nationalized. Uh, so tell us how these different, very different political economic systems affect uh, supply chain and availability. Yeah, I think um, it's really similar to what we've seen also in the approaches of um, containment of the uh, virus, where uh, when you have a totally nationalized system like in China, you can make these huge broad strokes. You can shut down an entire city and contain spread of the virus um, at will. Um, they can do the same thing with their sort of semi-nationalized factories and uh, crank up their production of whatever they uh, whatever they want to. You know, I think it does make it um, a little easier for them, uh, for a, an economy like China's to uh, focus um, on us, on addressing a specific need um, in a way that it's harder to do in a more free market system like we have in the United States. Um, and it's these um, it's these crises where um, we're really dependent on cooperation and not competition between um, our between all the entities in our supply chain. So that being said, in um, in there is some light that we that we do work that way. Um, there's a a lot of industries, even outside of medicine, where you hear stories of uh, longtime competitors deciding that they need to collaborate on um, on helping each other survive or helping each other um, meet the demand for production, um, what, like during the crisis. Um, so I think people are coming together, working together, and then there's little elements like the DPA that I mentioned that are just there um, as contingency plans. It's not really the same as nationalizing um, our economy, but it is sort of handing over, mandating some of the control over the production uh, to the federal government. Um, but, I, but I do think it leaves us in these brief periods where we're a little more vulnerable and less able to focus until we all decide together um, how we're gonna change our production and distribution. And tell us a little bit about uh, the cooperation interaction between states and how that relates to um, the um, relationship between uh, hospitals uh, within a state. Um, in other words, uh, uh, how has uh, the, how have the interactions between states evolved and controlled the distribution of resources across hospitals? In a couple ways. One, um, if you looked at New York, they were on the forefront of already doing this. So in one of Andrew Cuomo's addresses, uh, he talked about how they were getting ventilators uh, 
from Oregon um, who wasn't as badly hit by the pandemic. And he explicitly said in his update, like, we're going to pay it back. As soon as Oregon has their day, we're going to send them ventilators once we're past our peak. So he was encouraging that kind of cooperation across state lines. Um, and uh, I will say there, from some of my interviews with supply chain people in various systems, um, I have heard some anecdotes of um, the state almost interfering kind of too much, um, that the hospitals are trying to get their own supplies of PPE and their own buffers um, for their own people. And they're trying to do things like basically beat the state to uh, a known shipment of N95 masks um, and claim it before the, before the state can and try to get them into places um, where, so where it's more available to the hospital. So I think it has put a little bit of and again, anecdotally, some strain on those relationships, um, which is again a whole another argument for how like just general cooperation um, is crucial to making sure uh, the supplies are evenly distributed. What strikes me in that is that it's dependent on one-off deals uh, between uh, uh, governors from different states. Um, uh, as opposed to an organized approach to distribute um, resources in an equitable way or in a, a demand-oriented way. Yep, and that gets back to needing more data about what's needed where and what's gone where and, and kind of keeping a ledger of, of things, which I think we would need some kind of, again, I think the federal government's maybe the only entity poised to do this, but uh, some kind of central, like you were saying, place uh, to keep track of it. So Adipa and Neelan, um, tell us a little bit more about the retraining of individuals um, or house staff uh, to fill different needs uh, in the hospital as this uh, uh, crisis evolved. Um, uh, people, uh, folks or trainees who, who normally didn't, haven't taken care of uh, intensive care patients uh, were deployed to the ICU uh, when, uh, when we were uh, in phase three of uh, the response. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about how that affected uh, um, in a positive and potentially negative way the uh, um, uh, the uh, spirit of the house staff and the ability of the house staff to work with each other. So I can speak to the first part. So in terms of retraining, I think a couple of things. Um, our residents uh, were pulled from electives to uh, work, help support their colleagues during this time with the increased volumes. Um, I think we're lucky as internal medicine residents that we get to work in many different settings, the floors, the ICUs, the outpatient settings. So I think in terms of um, being able to work in the ICU, our residents are ready to go. The difficult part of this is the physiology uh, that goes with these COVID-19 patients, especially the very ill ones that have been in all of the units in the last couple of weeks. And so some of the things that have been happening in the last couple of weeks are um, during our noon conferences, um, Dr. Andy Hedler, one of our co-chiefs gave a talk about ECMO um, and ways to, and ways to th things to look out for during your time during the units. We've also had a number of great grand rounds that talked about ARDS physiology. Um, I think the biggest thing that was difficult to prepare for that none of us really did prepare for was the emotional aspect that goes along with not having the family member at the bedside and having these really difficult conversations over the phone. Um, in terms of outlets or ways to address that, Denver Health, for example, there have been a number of programs, but just one at Denver Health, there's this a program called RISE, um, Resilience and Stressful Events. They host meetings every Thursday that's available to anybody that works there um, just to talk through some of the, the ways and that they have been dealing with things like this and then these difficult emotional conversations. So there are programs like this that have helped support um, some of these difficult scenarios that we've encountered throughout the time here. The other aspect is, um, so as internal medicine residents, like we talked about, we work in the ICUs, but um, there's also a discussion about a GME pool where residents from other programs um, would help uh, support the ICUs and other floor services. Um, we haven't had to use that just yet, um, but there is something like that in the works in case we need it. 
Okay, this has been a great uh, discussion. I do have one last question that I'd like each of you to, to answer. Um, and I'm sure you'll have different perspectives on this. Um, how do you think uh, the, um, this pandemic has affected uh, the perception of our profession and uh, the pipeline of individuals that are um, drawn to uh, the medical profession and specifically drawn to internal medicine? I can go first on this one. Um, I guess I tend to take an optimistic stance, um, but I think I will say I saw a mural uh, on Colfax the other day of a person dressed in scrubs with a mask on holding two big boxing gloves and with these giant angel wings behind them. This was in like a public forum. And I think that the public perception of our profession has just really, really gone up. And um, I think this will be inspiring to future generations. And it's been really a privilege to be part of internal medicine the you know this pandemic is coming and we're the ones who have the expertise and we're the ones who are going to be there on the front lines um and especially it's been a privilege to support all of our residents um who are who have been outstanding examples of just the kind of fortitude um and uh and ability that you need uh to operate in a crisis like this and and I think that won't go unnoticed by even the medical students who are currently uh, training um, and who are choosing their specialties for next year's match, let alone the next generations of, of providers. Thank you. Deepa? So I will also take the optimistic stance on this as well. And we've heard nothing but enthusiasm, I think, surrounding the, the future of our residency program, our incoming interns and our residents who are going out to be in the workforce now. Um, I think the pandemic has brought to light a lot of the kind of typical emotions that we have in during training, a lot of the uncertainty, a lot of dealing with death and suffering and figuring out a way to emotionally process and, and cope a lot of these issues that come up. So I think it gives us almost an outlet optimistically to the public now knowing this. And I feel like some of us used to feel like this was a you know, small community of people who really understood what you were going through. But I feel like extending that now to the public will be really powerful for our experiences and being part of our community. So I will take the positive stance too. And Dr. Mystery, you have the last word. Um, so I agree with my colleagues. I think um, a lot of times uh, medical training, um, like you best said, a lot of times it's a closed box. Even when you talk with your family members, for example, people who have never seen someone go through residency or medical school, it's a very different thing when you're in it versus when you're not. And so I think this pandemic has opened the doors for other people to see what medical training can be, what it can be like. Obviously, this is an exaggerated form of what it is, but some of the struggles that we have seen our residents voice are struggles that are always there, not just there during the times of pandemic. Um, and so I think there's still optimism and um, people feel lucky that they are part of it, that they get to be in this profession to um, help others, which is why all of us went in there into medicine to begin with. That's great. Uh, thank you all very much for uh, uh, an incredibly educational discussion and um, opening up new thoughts for all of us. Um, and uh, you did, all three of you did a superb job. Thanks again and um, see you soon.